Welcome back to the Cannibal Mindset. And this has been an interview that has been circled on my calendar for, for over a month now, getting really, really excited. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was recommended a book called The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. And um, a coach had recommended it to me. Uh, a friend who's a coach had recommended it. You should, you should read this book. And I, so I immediately ordered it. I devoured it. And this was a couple of years ago. I devoured it in one day. Just went straight through it. Half the book was highlighted. Um, and then, you know, we worked our magic and, you know, we, we uh, found Gay and, and begged him to come on, uh, <laughs> begged him to come on the, on the podcast. So he's here today. And what's interesting is I went back uh, over the last couple of days, and I listened. I bought the Audible version, so you can buy the written version or you can buy the Audible version. I bought the Audible version, and I listened to it straight through. I listened to it while I was working out. I listened to it while I was driving. And what's crazy is the universe always conspires to give us what we want, and it was exactly what I needed right now in my life. Uh, so this book resonates perfectly with me. And you know, the reason we have the podcast, if you listen to this, you know this, is the reason we have the podcast is because I want the inside scoop on th people that inspire me. And so it's perfect timing. I have a list of topics I want to talk to Gay about, but I want to introduce Gay Hendricks, psychologist, writer, uh, uh, all things guru in the, in the field of personal growth, uh, was a professor, I believe, at Stanford University, graduated from Stanford University, has written over 40 books with him and his lovely bride. Uh, some of those books are The Big Leap, Conscious Living, Conscious Loving, uh, Learning to Love Yourself, The Genius, New York Times best-selling book, Five Wishes, uh, The First Rule of Ten, and of course, The Big, the big Leap. He's been on shows like Oprah, CNN, CNBC, 48 Hours, just to name a few, and now he's on the Cannonball Mindset. So I give it up. I'm really excited to introduce uh, Gay Hendricks. Gay, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Chad. It's really great to be with you. Uh, this, so I, I, I know we have we have a certain amount of time, and I want to kind of get into, into this book. So The Big Leap, The Big Leap, and again, you've written amazing books. Uh, again, wrote a New York Times bestseller called uh, The Five Wishes, so make sure you check that out. But I want to talk about The Big Leap because it was such a such a uh, pivotal book in my in my career, in my in my growth, my personal growth. Um, what is the big leap? When you talk about the big leap, what is the big leap and what does it mean? And give us a little bit about that, and I'm going to get into some real kind of conversations about it. The big leap, uh, the book The Big Leap, is about two big ideas, two big things that changed my life. And it took me 30 years of thinking about them to finally get down and sit down and write the book. Uh, people ask me how long it took me to write The Big Leap, and I say, well, it took me a year, but I've been thinking about it for 30 years beforehand, so it didn't <laughs> take me that long. But the two big ideas are this. The first one is what I call the upper limit problem, which is that all of us have things that we do that sabotage our success. So things start going better at work, or things start flowing better at home, and then unconsciously we do something that trips ourselves up, and knocks ourselves back down to a more familiar level of operating, which is not at our best. The, the second big thing that's in the big leap is that what you can do once you start dismantling your upper limit problems, and I show you how to do that in the book. We'll get into that. Um, once you start dismantling your upper limit problems, it becomes possible to open the door to what I call your genius mm -hmm. zone. Uh, the sequel to The Big Leap is called The Genius Zone. And both those books explore the territory of what's really possible for human beings. What are we at our highest level of functioning? Mm. And to me, that's when we're functioning in our genius, mm. both in the work we love to do and our home life, our business life. When we're operating in our genius zone, you're doing what you most love to do and also what your biggest contribution is to the world mm. around you. Mm. So that's my definition of genius. You're operating in your genius zone when you're doing what you love to do and you're doing things that make a big positive impact on people's lives. One of my long ago, uh, long ago mentors, Abraham Maslow, said it doesn't matter if your genius is making a great soup or writing a great symphony. They're both contributions to mm. the world around you. And I say the same thing, that 
maybe your genius doesn't involve writing a book or going on Oprah or any of those kinds of things. But what you can do is figure out what the sweet spot of your genius is in your life as it exists now and start doing more and more of that until you end up like I did at the end of the last century. I set a goal of being in my genius zone 100 percent of my time. So for the past 20 some years, I've only done things that I most love to do and that make a big contribution to other people's lives, hopefully. Like right now, I'm in my genius zone and so are you. And so when two people are in their genius zones creating something, there's a synergistic effect that big magic can happen. You know, maybe two people could make a salad together, but you and I are making a, a conceptual meal yeah. that many, many people, maybe millions of people can sit down and enjoy. I, love that. I was talking to my daughter on Christmas Day and I said, what are you doing today? And she was doing some of the regular stuff, but what she was doing at that moment was listening to a podcast. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's a great thing right. uh, that to be doing on Christmas Day, in my view, expanding oh, no. your possibilities in life growing on christmas so, day yeah the big leap is about expanding into your genius zone and what you have to do to do that and i present in the big leap a whole series of things that you can do to get yourself out of your upper limit problems and get yourself established in the genius zone then the new book the sequel to the big leap the genius zone is once you get there, how to stay there. Yeah. And so um, both of the books have a big, two big points to them. But the point of the big leap is get yourself out of your upper limit problems, and here's how, and then get yourself established in your d genius zone doing what you most love to do. Love this. And so this is, <laughs> so I'm going to, I'm going to use me as a, as a guinea pig here, right? Cause, cause w when I was reading this book the first time, and really when I was just listening, re listening to it on Audible, um, was this idea of the upper limit problem. I mean, the upper limit problem, I've had great success over the last three to five years in you know growing my company. I feel like I'm in the healthiest shape of my life, like I'm in my genius, what you would call your genius zone. But I keep running my head into the wall with these self-fulfilling, sabotaging ideas or beliefs, and you talk about the limiting beliefs and this upper limit problem. So I hit I hit the ceiling, I'm, I'm climbing, and then I, it's a self-inflicted wound brings me back down. And how do you get, so I want to really dive into this upper limit problem, because I keep running into the same wall. When things are going really good, somehow I'm expecting it to fail or doing things to subconsciously make it fail. Yes. Well, I appreciate you asking the question that way, making it a personal thing, because that's how I learned about it first myself, was by exploring my own upper limit problems. And I found in the beginning, I was only operating in my genius zone about 10% of my day. And the rest of the time I was doing stuff I thought I had to do or stuff I had to do or people were expecting me to do, but it wasn't in the sweet spot of my genius. And I started looking at this upper limit issue in myself, and I realized that, like at the time, I was overweight, and I lost the weight by spotting the upper limit problem. I, I noticed that I would turn to the refrigerator when I was having certain feelings, like if I was sitting at home alone on a Saturday night and I was feeling lonely, I'd try to solve the problem by eating something and putting it in my belly. But I started being smarter about my emotions and I realized, oh, there's one big emotion that's underneath everything that troubles me, and that's the emotion of fear. And I started looking at the fears that were underneath the upper limit problem. And I discovered that there's only a few, there's only a handful, but most everybody experiences one or more of them. Uh, the biggest one, Chad, is the fear that I'm fundamentally flawed mm. in some way, that I'm the wrong gender, or I'm the wrong age, or I'm the wrong weight, or I'm the wrong ethnicity, or whatever it is. We have ourselves limited by a limiting belief that says, I can't go to my full 
expansion in life because fill in the blank. Yeah. Because I'm too short or too tall. Or, you know, one of my uh, clients has become a successful entrepreneur, uh, a woman. You know, it broke her heart. She got shut out of the uh, ballet because she was too tall. She shot up to about six <laughs> feet tall as she was an adolescent and they said, we don't need six foot tall ballerinas because the rest of them are only five. five. Right. <laughs> and, uh, so, um, so she carried that though into, into life, not just that she was too tall, but that she couldn't re reach her dreams for some reason. Yeah. And so I say baloney to all of that because I've seen people do some of the most amazing things, you know, like I've worked with people that had trouble getting out of junior high school because they didn't fit in school. And yet later on, they were able to run a successful business kind of intuitively. Well, you know, that's pretty amazing stuff when you think yeah. about it. And I've seen people who were physically handicapped lead remarkable lives. And so to me, we have to look first at do I feel like I'm fundamentally flawed in some way? And if you do, just acknowledge that and realize you've been carrying that around, but take it from me, it's a lie. You, yeah. It's something you got told a long time ago or something you told yourself to make yourself feel better or something like that. But there are no limitations that I know of. I mean, certainly if you're, you know, a petite five foot one, you're probably less likely to make it in the NBA. I mean, you just have right. to look at some standard things like that. But beyond the obvious, what's to prevent? I mean, I don't know if you're an NBA fan, but do you yeah. remember Muggsy Bogues? Oh, yeah, love, love Muggsy Bogues. The guy was five foot six. That's right. And he could literally run between the legs of people in the NBA, you know? Yeah. And yet he played major league basketball for a long time. Um, so I want to dissuade anybody that there actually have limitations, but I want to point to the fact that if you believe in your limitations, that's what you get. Yeah. Even if you don't, uh, if, if, like, if you think you don't deserve love, you won't get love. Correct. The moment you start thinking, well, wait a minute, there's no such thing as deserve. I want to enjoy more love in my life. The moment you open up those kind of new ideas in the big leap, you're on your way because you're, uh, you're on your way to freeing yourself of your limitations. And that's a tremendously exciting thing to do. Once you do that, you know, like I had a client this past year that I was working with. I have a mentorship program that I do with four entrepreneurs a year uh, where I kind of take them under my wing and for uh, two times a month, I meet with them. Well, this young man came in and he was running two successful businesses and suddenly got the urge to write a book. And so he not only wrote his book over the past year and a real good one, too, but he sold one of his businesses. Uh, he wanted $50 million for it and he ended up selling it for $54 million. Wow. See what can happen when you remove your limitations. Suddenly you're accessing new creativity that you never knew was there. Once we opened up to what his genius was, he realized, oh, I've learned some things in business over the past 15 years that I want to put in a book. And so I said, okay, well, what's it going to take? And he said, well, I only have 20 minutes a day that I can really devote to that. And we made a commitment around that. And he worked on that book for 20 minutes a day. And in the course of 11 months, created a 240-page book. Wow. So don't anybody tell me you don't have time to write your book. You know, he had 20 minutes, and yet he got it done. Uh, and so uh, we actually recommend to get into your genius zone, just start with 10 minutes a day devoted to things you love to do and things that make your biggest contribution to the world. And then graduate up from there. The second week, maybe do 20 minutes. And so you gradually build up like, you know, you don't want to go to the gym and try to do 500 chin-ups your first day. Yeah, right. 
So it's going gra- to be gradually depressing. work into it. So how do you? So so yeah, so, gradually work into it. So how do you? So so first of all, so the upper limit problem. And one of the things you talked about is when things. And this is what seems to happen with me when things are going really well. I and you said it. You uh, manufactured. I manufacture unpleasant thoughts when things are going well. Things are going well, and you say <laughs> things like, "Well, is this is just luck? It's all going to run out," or you know, "This was this is never meant to be," or um, "This is I'm operating way outside of my my potential," or uh, "The market's going to come and the market's going to hit us in the face." And this is you know in the in the in the, in the businesses that we deal with as a my, the company I own, um, a lot of them are starting to feel the the, the um, pressure of the market. The market's starting to change. People's uh, income's starting to change. And they're manufacturing more unpleasant thoughts, which only then sets the line of that unpleasant, of the upper limit problem. And I think you said in the book you mentioned a little bit earlier is that if you fight for your limitations, you get to keep them, right? You get to keep the limitations <laughs> you fight for. Um, how... Why does this happen? Like, why ultimately? Why does it happen? Why do we self sabotage and and manufacture these unpleasant thoughts when things are going well? Yes, well, that's the thing because when things start going well, most of us don't have a template built inside us for allowing things to go well mm. for long periods of time. Mm. Like I discovered early when I began to apply this to relationships, I found that. Well, I wasn't married to Katie yet uh, when I first started thinking about these things, but I I realized that my girlfriend and I at the time would get in a fight on the average. We'd argue about every three days. So we seemed to have this two and a half day upper limit on how much intimacy we could stand. And then somebody would criticize the other one. And then, you know, like all couples arguments are a race to occupy the victim position. Mm. And so one of us would start saying, oh, you're doing it to me. You know, if you just do, 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 I'd be a lot happier. And of course, the other one doesn't ever say, you know, dear, you're right. <laughs> I am responsible for all your miseries. You know, yeah. most of us don't do it like yeah. that. We say, wait a minute, I'm the victim That's here. Exactly right. If you'd stop doing X, Y, and Z, then I'd feel better. And then we'd be off to the races for a few days. Does that sound familiar at all? <laughs> yes. Yes. I've been married 20 years. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds familiar not just in my marriage, but in my work relationships. It sounds familiar. It's, it's, yes, it resonates with me very much. Yeah. And I think it resonates with all of us because we've all been there. But here's exactly what happens, Chad. Things are going along fine. And then up comes that old fear. Oh, I'm not entitled to feel love this much all the time. Mm -hmm. I'm a fundamentally flawed person. I don't deserve love. That's just one of the fears. Let me talk about another one. Very big fear called the fear of outshining other people. You start to suddenly feel better and your work is glowing and you're making contributions. And then all of a sudden something happens and you pull back down and aren't having as much fun, aren't making as big a contribution. Because so many of us have from childhood a fear of outshining other people. Mm. We have this internalized belief that we're not supposed to be the star. Everybody else is supposed to be the star. And, you know, especially if you're a middle child or, you know, kind of in the middle of a family somewhere where there's a golden boy or a golden girl. Like in my family, my brother, he was eight years older. He was the golden boy, straight A's never screwed up, uh, Eagle Scout, right. <laughs> you know, the, the kind of person that you just hold up as the example. I came along, I wasn't, I quit Scouts, I screwed up from time to time. I I was real smart, but I screwed off in school, so I made Bs and Cs half the time. They were always coming to me and saying, you aren't living up to your potential, son. And uh, so... I realized eventually I had that fear that I wasn't supposed to shine. I was supposed to stay back in the pack. I don't know if you've ever done any uh, workshops in uh, Sweden or Australia, but they have an upper limit built right into the language of their culture. In Sweden, they have this interesting word, and everybody knows it immediately, called lagom. And lagom means don't be too far ahead. Don't be too far behind. Be right in the middle. Kind of keep your head right in the middle of the pack. Yeah. Now, oh. go down to Australia. They have a thing called the tall poppy syndrome. 
Don't be the tall poppy. Don't stick your head out above the rest of the flowers because the farmer will cut it off first. So stay down in the pack. And, you know, a, a lot of Australian culture was built around convict culture because so many of their early citizens came there in chains. Right. And uh, so that's kind of a prison way of looking at the world. You know, stay down in the pack. You know, don't uh, don't get out there too far. And so a lot of us have that internalized feeling that we're not supposed to shine. And I want to dissuade everybody from that because that's just an old limiting belief. Mm. You have every right, every, I would say almost a duty to shine because I believe that unless we really open up to and express our genius, not only are, are we not happy, but we can't make a big contribution right. to other people too. So it's only when we can be doing what we're wonderfully suited to mm. do in life that we can make our best contribution to other people. Oh my gosh. Um, like I feel like I'm at church because you're, you're preaching right to me. Like this idea of like most people have uh, become settled or told to play the supporting actor in their own movie. Right? So like everybody plays a supporting actor. Nobody wants to play because this idea of like, if, I, if I make myself the lead actor, most people aren't even the lead actor or actress in their own movie. They play the supporting cast and they don't ever get to that zone of genius and they fall into this. They're, they're limited by this upper limit problem. I love the term the upper limit problem. Like is as you rise, you like hit the ceiling as opposed to saying, well – Today's ceiling is tomorrow's floor because I have more. I can keep going. I can keep getting more. They just don't. They don't recognize that. And I think your book illustrates that. So how do you get? How do you get from the upper limit problem to the zone of genius? How do you even find out? And you've mentioned it. You said it a couple of times. But how do you? How do you find out? what your your zone of genius is? Like what is my genius? And how do I? How do I identify? my zone of genius. If somebody's listening here and saying, oh, I get it. I don't know if I buy in because I have all these excuses of why I can't be successful, but I'll, but I'll go along. How do I find my zone of genius? The best way is to start asking yourself a big, what I call a wonder question. And the wonder question is, hmm, what do I most love to do? And at first, focus on your work. Hmm, in my work, what do I most love to do? And almost everybody, even if they tell me they hate 90% of their job, they find a part of it that they love to do. And so that's one criterion, in my view, for the, the zone of genius, is what I love to do. A second dimension of it is contribution. What do I do that makes the biggest contribution to other people in terms of helping other people feel like their lives have more value. Mm. That's my, when I sit down and write to write every day, uh, you know, I've, I've, I'm about to publish, I think my 51st book this year. Oh, and so I've been at this writing thing for more than half my life now. And I, I do the same thing. I wake up early. I'm an early riser. And so I wake up at four, four thirty. So by five thirty, quarter six, after I've meditated and had on something to eat, I'm at my computer and I write for a couple of hours. Now, why would a person do that? Of course, I make money from my books and everything. But after a while, that doesn't do it anymore. There's something else that makes me do it. And it's contribution. Mm. I want to have anything I know that's of value. I want it out there so other people can use it. I get email all the time from people. In fact, I always say I have the best inbox in town because every day, I get to read through things that people have written me, big leaps that they've made. And so it doesn't matter if you're a, you know, like I got an email from somebody in the outback of Pakistan that said they were able to suddenly afford cell phones to, to work with in their business, you know, and thanks for, you know, they thank me for the yeah. insights and the big leap or another person might like my client might say, Thank you for helping me sell my $50 million company for $54 million, you know, because once we did some expansive work around that issue, suddenly he got a bigger offer than he was even expecting. And so those kinds of things tell me that two things, love and contribution 
are the two beneficiaries of us being in the zone of genius. And so ask yourself, what do I most love to do and what makes the biggest contribution? Two other questions that I always ask people is, what could I do all day long joyfully for nothing if I had some other way to you know, pay my bills and uh, have my finances work? Yeah. What would you do all day long if you could do it and, the, and didn't have to worry about money? I love that question. Well, this is one of the things. You and I are doing it, right? That's right. That's what I'm doing right now. You would happily, if you had plenty of money to pay off your bills and everything, you would just love to help people access their genius all day long. Exactly. In one exactly. way or the other. That's, that's, what, that's what you do. And to me, that's a beautiful thing. If you've paid enough dues to get to the place in life where you can ask that question, that's a good thing. And from then on, it's a process of refinement. You know, maybe today you're spending four hours a day doing what you most love to do. Next year at this time, it's five or six hours. I went from an hour a day to all the time from the 1980s to the end of last century. Mm. So by the end of last century, I was spending all my time in my genius zone. Mm. So for the past 23 or four years, I've only done stuff I love to do and stuff that, in my opinion, makes a contribution to other people. And it's a great life because I wouldn't want to retire you know, I, I haven't had to work in 30 years, thanks to our dear friend Oprah yeah. uh, putting us on her show a couple of times. That solved all my financial <laughs> problems, and uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Oprah. And Oprah makes dreams come thank true. Thank you, Oprah. <laughs> yeah. At least once a day. Yeah. Katie and I look over there. She's a 15 miles away from us. Thank you, Oprah. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and That's I great. bumped into her friend uh, Stedman on the golf course a while back and <laughs> had the opportunity to uh, to tell him. Uh, <laughs> say, say thank, thank you, you. Oprah again. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so um, that's another aspect, Chad, and that is another ticket to your genius zone is gratitude. Mm. Being grateful for what you have been given on a daily basis will help you express more of it. So if you start being grateful for the things that are in your genius zone, then you start proliferating that. It starts happening more and more. So gratitude is an amplifier of genius. Ding, 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 ding. Put that on a sweatshirt, everybody. Gratitude amplifies genius. The more grateful you are to, what, to what's going on in your life right now, even if it's not pleasant all the time, but the more you can be grateful for the, the things you're learning and for the life you're living, the more that opens you up to expressing your genius. I found that was a surprise to me. I didn't realize how tight a connection there was between gratitude and genius until I started living out of gratitude more than living out of entitlement or expectation. Love this. I love this. So, all right. So, I find my so so I find my working genius. Well, you know, uh, what do I love to do? What I love to do, right? What do I love to do, uh, and what am I good at? What am I? What what are all these things? So, I figured out my my working genius, right? Uh, my genius. I get my genius. Then I start having success. Won't I run into an upper limit problem again? Like, will, I, will this upper limit problem keep showing itself? Even if I'm in my genius, if I have success, will I run into this again? Yes, genius is not a one-time only thing. Here's the way to think of it. That's why I say track the amount of time you spend in your genius every day. Uh, and if that's 10 minutes, great. If that's 10 hours, great. But at least you have something to go by. Yeah. So um, you'll break through into your genius zone and then you'll create another upper limit. Yeah. And then you'll break through again and you'll create another upper limit. Genius works on a spiral. Mm. So at a higher level, you pass by the same issue that you had before. Wow. But this time you go, oh, I see that issue. Hello, I'm not going to indulge in that this time. Mm. Ah. Yeah. You know, like I have a good friend that I play golf with sometimes. Uh, I've been a member over here at the Ojai Valley Inn Golf Club for uh, 20 some years now. And so it's kind of my home away from home. 
I'm an avid golfer, although not a not a genius zone yet in my golfing life. I'm an 18 <laughs> handicapper, so I have plenty of room for improvement. Yeah. But I'm only 77, so, so I've yeah, got play, a long way to time. go yet. But I, I play golf with a guy who, uh, up until 17 years ago, was a blackout alcoholic, and literally he would lose days of his life where he didn't know where he'd been or what he'd done, and. Then through the magic of 12-step work, he got up in front of a group one day, said, my name is John and I'm an alcoholic and I don't know what I'm going to do, but I got to do something different with my life. And he's had now 17 years, wow. God bless him, of sobriety. And But he says not a day goes by, even after 17 years, as life gets better and better, he has an occasional urge to mess the whole thing up. You know, and that's the upper limit problem. Even though you've you've handled it and aren't acting out actively anymore, you'll still see it go by now and then. And that's a good thing. You want to keep it in mind. It's just like, uh, you know, I, I say the upper limit problem is like having a bull that you're taking care of. You have a hundred acre pasture, but for some reason you keep the bull in a 10 foot corral. <coughs> You know, surrounded by its limiting beliefs. But if you take down the wall and just say, do your thing, you know, you'll see the ball 100 yards away and it won't be bothering anybody. Yeah. You know, so uh, you've got the same thing, but your perspective toward it is different. And awareness and eventually loving acceptance is a very powerful tool of transformation, Chad, because once you see the fears that are underneath your upper limit problems. The only thing that will heal them is to lovingly accept them. Mm. You mm. can't shame them out of your body and say, oh, you shouldn't be there. And you can't surgically remove your fear without surgically removing the middle of your body oh, <laughs> because it's been in there for 50 million years now evolving. Mm. And so what we need to do is make friends and lovingly accept our fears and our angers and our griefs all of the things that often we use to limit ourselves. Accepting and loving those things is actually the path to being free of them because the moment you do that, they lose your grip on you. Yeah. And you say, oh, yeah, I have anger in me, but I'm not trapped by my anger anymore. You know, it's like my mom, when I, I grew up in a single-parent family and my uh, mom was raising two boys, my brother and myself, and I was the younger one. I was uh, only, um, I think, about four or five when the following incident happened. My brother was probably, well, he's eight years older, so uh, he was an early teenager, uh, but he slept in a different room, so I, uh, he wasn't involved in this situation. I woke up one night, and the way the curtain in the room was, I thought I saw a monster in it. And I got really scared and I yelled and my mother um, came in and said, what's wrong? And I told her about the uh, monster in the, uh, in the curtain. And it turned out the window was open and it was blowing the curtain a certain way that it sort of looked like Casper the ghost, you know. And so, but my mother was very smart psychologist. She was actually a, a newspaper writer, but um, she was probably a good intuitive psychology. She got a flashlight and she said, okay, if that happens again, just shine the light up there and see what it looks like. Cause she shone the light all around. She saw, okay, yeah, that looks like a ghost, but that's just a curtain, you know, yeah. when you look at it more closely. And so I had my little flashlight and I never woke up again and had to use it, you know, cause I had a tool then mm. to deal with my fear. Love that. Well, the tools I want to give you and, and share with you to deal with your fear are natural and organic. They don't involve pharmaceuticals or anything like that. First, use your body wisdom. Breathe with your fear. Open up to it. Inquire into it. Ask yourself, what am I really afraid of? Am I afraid that there's something fundamentally flawed about me? Or am I afraid of shining? Or another fear is, I'm afraid if I really expand, I'll 
leave behind people that are dear to me. Mm. And so that fear of leaving other people behind keeps us stuck mm. in situations where we would probably be better off maybe to move beyond certain relationships that are holding us back. So those kinds of what I call wonder questions are really a great tool to get out of any kind of fearsome situation because you always wonder, hmm, what is this really about? What am I really afraid of? And when you come right down to it, there are only a few fears that really slow us down. The next move, though, of course, is to get into that genius zone as quickly as possible by asking yourself what you really love to do and what your biggest contribution is going to be. What if what if you're afraid? Let me go back a second, too. I love this conversation on fear, and you had a great description in the book. You called it the fog of fear and the clarity of exhilaration, right? I think it's what the, it was your exact terms. Um, and so what if your fear, what if your fear is that you're actually afraid of losing what you already have, right? So like mm -hmm. you, you talk about leaving a people behind, but what if the fear, and this has been, this, listen, this has been the, the, the upper limiting problem for me was as I have all the success, I don't have a high school, I don't have a college degree. I graduated high school with a 1.6 grade point average. I was never on my cards to do this, what I'm doing. Uh, but I'm clearly in my zone of genius. I, I'm clearly, I'm doing what I love. But what if your fear is like, well, I have a pretty damn good life. And I better hold on to it really tight because if I don't, I'm going to lose it all. What if that? What if that's your fear? How do you get past that? Out of that fog of fear and into the into the clarity of exhilaration. That's a great question. First of all, I've been asked that many, many, many times by people who had really amazing lives going that they didn't want to dismantle. And I think, first of all. Let yourself know that to expand your genius, you don't have to really dismantle anything but your upper limit problem. You know, that you don't have to change your life out there. Sometimes they will change, but you don't have to make any external shifts in order to open up to more genius. So it's an inside job at first. And so let yourself, so that belief that if I open up to my genius, everything will fall apart. That's an upper limit belief. Yeah. That's an old upper limit belief. And so shine, shine my mom's flashlight on that. You know, look at that and say, okay, that's a fear of mine. Ah, <sighs> now let me find a safe, gentle way of going beyond that fear. You know, a lot of people have that fear at midlife, uh, you know, anywhere from 45 to 55 years old, what they like, traditionally call midlife zone there, 42 to 55 maybe. Uh, a lot of people come up against that because, first of all, they've built a pretty successful life. You know, I've, I've, gosh, I've probably had a hundred different doctors or lawyers or successful people at age 40 or so tell me something like you just said. They'll say, you know, I really want, I'm, I feel like I'm burning out doing what I'm doing, but my wife loves belonging to the best club in town. My kids like, going to this school, they like flying first class, you know, I'm afraid of dismantling all that stuff. If I start, if I take my head out of the trench for a few minutes, you know, That's right. and That's um, right. it's really interesting. I've given umpteen different speeches to uh, groups like the YPO, the Young Presidents Organization, yeah. uh, and you probably know them. Yep. They're it's like a number of groups. They're built of uh, people in their 30s and 40s who are really building businesses really fast. Well, I'll say to them, how long has it been since you've taken a day and deliberately not thought about your business all day? And usually an uproar will break out in the room because first of all, they feel guilty. They haven't done that. But second, they start telling me that that's impossible. If I took one day off, Everything would fall apart. I'm building a fifty million dollar business, and it depends on me, Doctor Hendrickson. You're just you're you're an airhead for thinking that I could even take a day off. Well, it's it's always the same conversation because it's the excellent zone where many people get stuck is an addiction. It mm. it wants to keep you there, um, and you know like. 
my friend I was referring to who changed with the 12-step program, he had friends before, so-called friends, before he uh, went to that first meeting that tried to talk him out of it. You know, and I mean, there are active forces in our lives that are trying to hold us back oftentimes. And there are plenty enough forces in the outside world without considering all our inner stuff. But, you know, a lot of the stuff in the outside world, we're not going to change that as much as we can quickly change our own yeah. upper limit beliefs so that we're not being enslaved by those anymore. Yeah. So um, I forget where I started uh, so, so with this first, whole yeah, point. So, so but, I jumped in. I cut you off. So uh, the first thing is kind of uh, accept it, breathe it in, breathe it out. You hit to get the fear. You breathe it in. Use your body. What was the second step? So now, now I, I breathe it in. I breathe it out. And then the second step is to dive into your zone of genius and take action. Yes, because that's a, a perfect moment to say, okay, what could I be doing right now that I love to do and that makes a contribution to other people. Yeah. If you can catch yourself right in that moment, you're going to make huge progress. Because, see, you don't have to spot these things many times. Like, I didn't have to spot the monster in the curtain but one time. And that cured me of the problem. Next time it happened, I say, oh, that's just the curtain blowing. Because I had my tool of my flashlight. So now you have these organic tools, breath, loving acceptance, Focusing on your genius. Here's another great way to think about your genius, Chad. Um, I grew up in central Florida in a little town of about 10,000 people. And it's, it's the unromantic part of Florida, like the ocean is about 60 miles away. Uh, what was in my part of Florida were things like alligators, rattlesnakes, <laughs> orange trees, uh, That's right. mosquitoes, yeah. the world's largest mosquitoes, I think. Um, and uh, did you grow up there where you live now? Uh, no, I live in, I grew up in Maryland, yeah, but I know, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so there was a set of beliefs in the town, you know, a set of limiting beliefs, I think, that were built into that. And anybody that started thinking differently and everything, you'd almost – be afraid of thinking differently and you live in a small town like that. But at a certain point, like I remember when I heard as a kid, uh, I heard two things. I was in a lumber company with my dad, uh, with my granddad. My father was dead. Um, but my granddad and my grandmother, uh, raised me as much as my mom did. And I was with my granddad in a, in a lumber company and he went in to get some two by fours. And I was probably eight or 10 years old at the time. And I saw this picture on the wall of this elderly white haired gentleman with kind of wild looking white hair. And I asked my granddad, who is that? Is that the owner of the store? And my granddad looked at it and said, oh, no, that's Albert Einstein. Hmm. Now, I don't know why a lumber company in Leesburg, Florida would have a picture of Albert Einstein on the wall. But anyway, they did. Oh. And so I said, uh, I thought immediately, oh, he must grow watermelons or something in Central Florida if he's a famous person. And I said, uh, is he from around here? And my granddad said, no, uh, he lives up in Princeton or something like that in New Jersey. And I said, well, what's he do? And my granddad said, he's a thinker. And I remember this light going on in my mind saying, and I said this to my granddad, wait a minute. You can get paid for that, <laughs> you know, because my limiting belief, my family owned six acres of orange groves. Yeah. And, you know, that's how we made our living. And my mom wrote for the local newspaper, which didn't make much of a living. But, you know, it was uh, enough to scrape by on. But those oranges, that was kind of our livelihood every year. And so my limiting belief hadn't even considered that somebody could make a living doing something that wasn't, you know, like with their hands or, uh, you know, something that in, involved nature. So that was a big breakthrough for me. And I remember telling all my friends about it. Have you heard about this guy, Albert Einstein? <laughs> None of my friends had heard of him either, but uh, we were, uh, that was my obsession there for a while. Well, he gets paid to think. That's the, like, the, the, yeah. like that's got to be a mind-blowing shift moment. Like, wait, wait. You don't have to live on a plantation growing oranges and fighting mosquitoes. 
right? But you, you, you see the world that's around you and that's what you accept. And so it's interesting how our upper limits are formed. And when we remove that upper limiting problem, it's amazing what will open up in front of you. Is that right? I'm saying once, once you break through that ceiling, like, oh, my goodness, look what was waiting for me. Now you just got to take action. To your point, now I just have to take small, small decisive actions every day in that. And eventually that two minutes becomes five minutes, that five minutes becomes ten minutes, that ten minutes becomes an hour. And, you know, I think you said it, you know, for the last 20 years, you haven't done anything that's outside of your zone of genius. Yeah, and don't plan to either. Yes. Uh, once you're in the sweet spot, it really kind of has a life of its own. It's not a, it's not even something I have to think about anymore. You know, I haven't had a, an alarm clock that I had to get up for in you know 30 or 40 years, uh, but I still wake up every day just as excited about what I get to do yeah. this day, and I hope I'm going to get to continue doing that as long as I'm so breathing the fine oxygen of this planet. Well, what's interesting, here's what's interesting. So it would be interesting the different types of mindsets and perceptions of how people hear that, right? So I think people with an upper limiting problem will say, well, he can only do that because he was on Oprah. He can only do that because of this or that, which is a limiting belief right there in itself, whereas you get to do this because you got rid of the limiting belief. Does that make sense? It's like, I could do that if I didn't have this, which is the upper, which is the limiting belief, which is the upper limiting problem, which causes them not to be able to ever get to that work zone of genius. Is that right? Yeah, because it took me uh, back in the 1980s. It took me seven or eight years of unpeeling my upper limit problems and moving on into my zone of genius until we yeah. got the call from Oprah. That's right. You know, so I'd been at it for a long time. That was just the latest. In fact, I remember Katie and I sitting in front of the fireplace. We're just uh, celebrating our 43rd anniversary this year, but this goes back wow. uh, 30 years. So we, we've been together about 10 years when we were first on Oprah around 1990. And But in 1988, I remember sitting in front of the fireplace. We lived in an apartment at the time. And we had just finished working with a couples group of about half a dozen couples in our living room. And my wife is a psychologist also. And at the end of that, she and I were sitting in front of the fireplace just talking over what had happened. And I remember saying, this stuff we're doing works so well, we really ought to write a book about it. Mm. And she, we got excited about it. By the time we were, you know, an hour later, we had Conscious Loving, our book Conscious Loving, oh, yeah. pretty well sketched out. And so I went to work on it, and Katie did, and it took us a year to write it. But it had such a glow around it that the first call our publicist made was to Oprah and she booked us mm. within a minute. Uh, and three days later, I always say we went, we went from working with six couples in our living room to 10 million couples or 10 million people wow. on Oprah in, uh, overnight, but it actually took three days. Wow. <laughs> and, wow. uh, it was quite a thing. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, people say sometimes, what's it like being on Oprah? And I said, well, I'll tell you a good way to approximate it. Go down to the local coffee store and order 10 shots of espresso and go slurp, 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 <laughs> slurp, and then wait about an hour and you'll feel exactly what the energy is like when you walk on that stage at Oprah. Wow. You know, it's kind of like vibrating. Oh, yeah. And, uh, but uh, it, it's great. I love it. That's um, fantastic. We've been on 500 shows, I think, over the years, and they gradually all sort of blur into one, except for Oprah. That always stands yeah, by well, itself well, for, it's, for it's, several yeah, reasons. because it's Oprah. But, here, but I think that's the key. I think the key for people to listen to this is that – the, the the way you live your life now in the sense of I spend my time in my zone of genius is a result of removing the upper limit problem. Like you're never going to get yes. to that zone of genius if you're not willing to confront the upper limiting problem, question it, right? So, so you lean into it, take a deep breath, you know, question it, and then basically now start taking small decisive actions in your zone of genius and before you know it you pick up momentum you pick up you pick up you have gratitude which you talked about everything starts to play in back oh i run into the upper limiting problem again i now know the recipe breathe in question it but we'll keep moving up and eventually you look back and you're like wow look how far i've come working in my work in my zone of genius that's a result of 
Yes. And it doesn't matter what level you're playing the game at. Yeah. I wish I'd gotten a call from Will Smith the night before the Oscars. <laughs> so I, I could explain the upper limit problem to him. Yeah. Well, you know, and I wish I, I'd gotten a call from Elon Musk <laughs> the night before he bought Twitter. So I could say, okay, look, uh, you it? know, you got to consider, have you thought about the possibility that you're going to lose two thirds of the value of your shareholder stock <laughs> by doing this? <laughs> you know, right. the next day. <laughs> that's right the next day <laughs> yeah. so it doesn't matter where you are in the game you got to keep your eye on those upper limit problems because they will have a tendency to swallow you up unless you're uh shining your flashlight on them all the time I, and i love i love this and i know we're running out of time but i love the idea of that you know i believe and one of the things i talk about a lot in my talks is that no one platform is more important than the other they're just different right so um you know the upper limiting problems of the person working at the chick-fil-a drive through right now are his or her upper limiting problems i have my upper limiting problems and they're both big to us right that's their upper limiting problems and you have to hey what do i love to do right what do i love to do what gives me contribution remove the upper limiting problem and other 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 opportunities will appear for you your life will get more abundant at that point would that be right it's an amazing process chad i really uh, i i can't encourage people enough to start opening up this conversation with themselves about Hmm, how do I upper limit myself? And hmm, what is my real genius contribution I want to make in this lifetime? Yeah. Today's upper limit problem is tomorrow's floor, if you're willing to if you're willing mm -hmm. to lean into it. Awesome. All right, two 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 two, two other questions for you. I know we're out of time. Um, all right, so where do people find you? So right now, I challenge anybody to buy this book, read this book immediately and put it into practice. I'd look at it and I, I'm saying this is why it called to me because I keep having, I, I, I look at my life and we've had so much success, so much like growth in my company, in my marriage, in my, in my spiritual life, in my personal life. And I look back and I'm like, I keep running to those, this upper limiting problem. When I read the book, I was like, ah, like he wrote this for me. Like, Dr. Hendricks wrote this book for me because it's exactly what I'm dealing <laughs> with. And then, but you're right. I question it. I question, hey, like breathe in, right? Come on now. Like, what is this upper limit problem? Identify it and then move on. Um, and it always works. I didn't know. I didn't know consciously until I read the book what it, what it was. But this is what it is. This is exactly what I was I'm doing and what it's what it's called. So you put a name to it, which is awesome. Um, where do people find you after they read the book? Where do they find you? How do they get more? You get 40 books. You can Google him and watch hundreds of interviews and episodes of, uh, of him talking. But where do people follow you and find you? Uh, the best place is to go to our main website, which is hendricks.com, H-E-N-D-R-I-C-K-S.com. And we have a lot of resources there, information about all of our trainings and that kind of thing. Also, we have a nonprofit foundation called the Foundation for Conscious Living. And if you go there, there are a lot of free resources there, like relationship videos mm. and training videos of various kinds. And it's all free there. It's sponsored by our foundation. So um, anywhere uh, you are, you can learn on the fly from um, what we have for offer. And I really appreciate everybody that comes there and participates because it's, uh, you know, we get thousands and thousands of visitors who later on turn around and tell their friends and, uh, Everything keeps expanding out into the world, which is a wonderful feeling we have every day. That's fantastic. Um, next time I'm in Ojai, by the way, if you don't know where Ojai is, just Google it. It is one of the most uh, interesting places in California by far, if not in the United States, um, but a great place in Ojai. Next time I'm in Ojai, I'm going to be knocking at your door with my golf clubs and um, play, play, yeah. playing around a golf Yeah, or, or what kind of handicap do you carry? Tell 18. Me. Do I have to fear 18. you? 18. 18. Yeah, 18. Okay. So, so we're even. Well, to be specific, I'm 18.6 as of this morning. <laughs> I just looked it up. Right? Right, uh, so uh, <laughs> by the time you get out here, though, I'm going to be a 17 or below. Oh, I like it. I like that is not enough for I, limiting problems. I was, like I was a 12 up until I wiped out my left knee, and now I have a, oh. a titanium left knee, and I haven't quite got to back to my old – uh, standards wow. yet, but I'm yep. working my way back in that. At direction. 18 with a titanium knee. I love that. Um, yeah. All right. Well, thank yeah. you for coming. I have one last question for you. Um, I've asked every guest of every episode I've ever done this question, and that is 
uh, in 30, 40, 50 years, 60 years when you leave this earth, what do you want your contribution to have been? Well, I have been making my best contribution the whole time. So if I die today, I am totally happy with what I've done so far. I've, um, when, I, when I got started, I wanted to make, one of my goals was to make a, to leave a written record of everything I've found of most value here in order to change ourselves and change our relationships. So I've done that to my satisfaction. Now, 10 years from now, when I finally cork off or whatever it is, I hope to have done more of the same. But uh, to me, it's all the same. It's all about, to me, fulfilling my life purpose, which is to expand in love, abundance, and creativity every day as I help people do the same thing, to expand into their fullness and their zone of genius every day. So if I can be doing that and doing that for myself every day, I'm a happy guy. Wow. Great answer. I would expect nothing less. Uh, go get the big leap. Go get the big leap. While you're at it, get five wishes as well. Uh, get the first rule of 10. Get the whole series, right? Get the zone of genius. Get them all. Get them all. Dive into it and make 2023 uh, the best year yet by, by removing your upper limiting problem. Thank you very much, Dr. Hendricks. Absolute uh, game changer. Uh, really enjoyed having you. Thank you. Many blessings to you. Have a great, Chad. have a great new year. Thanks. Bye.